Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 23. I'm your host, Dr. Ben Thompson, and today we are with Kat Penno. Kat is an audiologist in Western Australia, former owner operator of Hearing Collective, where she provided telehealth audiology services for over two years, and the current director of hearing health at New Hira. Kat, welcome. And I would love to first ask you to please go into details about what you learned during those two years with Hearing Collective and performing telehealth services. Cool, thanks. So good morning from my end and thanks for having me on the show, Ben. I love what you're doing and the content you're creating and the energy you're putting out there. It's really positive and favorable for everybody. Um, Oh yeah, Hearing Collective, what a blast. I don't know how you feel with your business, but it was a great upward learning curve and really different from what anybody in our industry was doing in general, especially in Australia. It was, I would say, I had a lot of learnings. The first one was that there is a lot of distrust between clients and hearing healthcare professionals. And that made me really frustrated and upset and a bit more motivated to put a good message out there about us as healthcare professionals, especially as audiologists. It's, you know, we don't, We don't study because it's cheap and free. We study because this is a a career that we want to work in and we we want to help people. So I was putting out an accessible point for people to reach out, an independent point of view for clients and customers to reach out and ask for support or advice or guidance. The second thing I learned was that digital literacy, so the ability for individuals to access services online or use services from the telehealth portion was still very, very new. So I launched Hearing Collective in November 2018. And I'd say for the first three to six months, it was me figuring out a lot of how to write a really succinct, nice email before the appointment of how to access the appointment and have a nice, smooth appointment time. It sounds easy to download the app and then access an appointment like this and it might be easier now but it's not that natural still for um the end user for those two and a half almost three years of running hc it got it got smoother towards the end and i really had to lessen i suppose that bit of content when i was emailing out and then the third thing i learned was that people really wanted to have an online touch point and then with certain hearing losses they wanted or hearing difficulties so not just hearing losses things like tinnitus and apds or unbalance those would then need to be referred out so it is is very very complementary. So the digital experience is very complementary to traditional services or models of care. I also was in a bit of a niche where I could see people and I loved talking to people virtually or face-to-face, but virtually obviously. And I had quite a few big companies come to me in the consumer electronics space that wanted to consult And so I spent my time between both virtual consultations and then consulting. And consulting, I I preferred. It was a less energy draining. And I'm sure a lot of um, healthcare professionals out there who listen to this can, we might be in agreement that it is, we give so much emotionally, whether it's face-to-face or virtually. And so to have a full day of appointments, I started to reduce from five days of appointments down to three and then to two or two and a half because I did find it too much. We may have heard the term Zoom fatigue. Zoom fatigue is real. I need to have that break and and step away. So there was a lot of good learning from a business sense, but then from a personal sense of what services or healthcare looked like to me in the future was becoming a bit clearer. Absolutely. I've followed you on numerous podcasts where you've been a guest and I wanted to bring you on as a guest here. I love your innovative forward thinking approach and hearing about 2018 and previously you said that at that time, starting a telehealth company in audiology was very progressive, very new. This was before times of COVID where now majority of people know what Zoom means or what telehealth or what a video conference call means. Whereas before then there was less technology. It was harder to have the automation systems and to have it smooth. There was less knowledge in the average person about how to use telehealth. And how did you develop trust with your patients and talk more about that mistrust you spoke of, of other hearing doctors. Was that in reference to being pushed certain products for treating hearing loss? Tell us more about that. We'd love to hear. Yeah, really good questions. Mistrust is my words, not not theirs, I guess, because a lot of my consults, to my surprise, because I guess I'd never seen it in traditional, the clinics I worked in traditionally, but people would come to me with their audiograms 
already with confirmed moderate severe hearing losses predominantly and say, oh, um, I saw someone and they said I needed these hearing aids. What do you think? And I say, oh, okay, well, you know, let's take a step back and go through your journey and create a relationship. And then I would ask them what they would want and what they thought. And then, yes, we got to the point where they, they would understand that they do need hearing aids. And it's giving them, I think, a little bit of extra time to give them that the service that they need. I'm not sure how appointments are constructed um, all over the world, but in Australia, they can be quite rushed. In within the first hour of doing the audiological assessment and giving a diagnosis, you're going straight into the hearing aid discussion or recommendations talk, which results in a hearing aid discussion. And if you think about it, and we're taught this at university as well, the amount of information you can retain in a 60-minute appointment is not very much. And if you are not, if you're new and you're you're new to the hearing journey and you've been confirmed that you've got a hearing loss, the first emotional response from clients is usually, it's, it's mixed, but it can be one of still denial. It can be shock. It can be anger. It can be sadness. And that's what they walk away with the appointment remembering that you've told me I've got a hearing loss and then they might look at their audiogram and and you've written down three or four hearing aids and the prices and go I I can't buy those hearing aids so that it's a little bit of the emotional processing and then this feeling of hang on I want to go back but my next appointment I was told is going to be the hearing aid confirmation appointment which one would you like or I'll call you and so the individual I found would be almost scrambling to find all this good quality information online. I was, um, I felt really fortunate that I had a lot of um, professionals refer to me as well from all the brands in, in that uh, here in Australia, which I was really grateful for. I'll, some people I knew, some people I didn't. So I think over time, as you build that, that awareness of what service you're doing, and then I'm paying and they might go back to that clinic. I didn't sell products, so my time was paid for in, in, in terms of or in regards to services. Mm-hmm. And then there was that that trust. So that's put that part. And then in regards to your first part, the technical portion, I think I'll answer this because I went down a bit of a, a rabbit hole there. It did become smoother towards the end be, before COVID. Well, in 2018, I was really like, I'm not really sure. I knew what I wanted to achieve with Hearing Collective in regards to building up awareness of audiological services and that being, you know, everyone. For me, I want people to have, when they have hearing loss or hearing difficulties or balance issues, to think audiologist is their first point of call. But it was still a little bit of a rabbit rabbit warren or hole to get to us. People think back pain, they might think physio or chiro. People think heart issues, cardiologist, you know, ear, any ear or balance disorder, audiologist straight away, not one or the other. I want people to come to us, that we're the trusted healthcare professional, and then refer out or or service within as as needed. So those are my ultimate goals with Hearing Collective. And yeah, it was a really good learning experience along the way. Did I answer the first part of your two part question? You did. Very well. Tell me more about during your sessions, what were the main reasons people were seeking help? Why would they go to you for an independent opinion as opposed to learning it themselves online or taking the word of their clinic audiologist or going to another clinic audiologist? Why would they, in your experience, go to an independent telehealth provider to review data? Talk us through how that went because I'm in that space as well, working with clients who have tinnitus and hearing loss and looking for that independent objective opinion. And you've done it, you've been, you did it for years. So any other tips or any other takeaways you had? Yes. So that I sh- clarifies all was one portion of clientele that came to me, clients who are ready on their hearing journey who needed, I think between you and I and, and everyone who's watching or listening, they might be able to, if you Google hearing, hearing loss, troubles, difficulties, hearing in a cafe, you are bombarded with a lot of information. And the biggest issue I think is, first of all, there's no brand awareness around anyone. There's no, when you think um, running shoes, you might have a brand that clearly comes to mind, really personalised as well. Uh, When you think for yourself, Ben, surfboards, you might have a brand that comes to mind. But when people think hearing loss, there's no brand that comes to mind at, at this stage. So all these pages pop up. And you go, oh, who should I go to out of all these ones that have popped up on the page? Mm. And when you do, some of them have pretty good information, but it's not enough. So 
I think there's information fatigue out there where clients go, okay, now now I know a lot. Well, now I know too much and I'm not going to make a decision. I've that, been that's there. That's very common in yeah, for everyone and in, in people in clients accessing our services. So there's a pain point there. I have um, so much information that I don't know what to do with it. Can you make this simple for me? 100%. So that, that's one client aspect. And then so they come to you or they would come to me and say, Cat, I've read this and that. I've seen my audiologist. I've seen an audiometrist. <clears throat> They've told me this. I've re- I've Googled this. I've spoken to my friend who lives next door who's done that. I've gone to my local club and, and I've, I've heard this. It's bringing the pieces of the puzzle together and then pre- painting a clear, succinct journey for them and building that, that confidence or trust. And then people would come back to me sometimes. I thought this the hearing aid would work like this. And it was, it was sort of nice because I didn't access any hearing aid software. Mm-hmm. during this time to be really just an objective point of view for these, yeah. for these did you see did did you see and recommend certain online products or over-the-counter products or products that a patient can just buy themselves yeah yeah the field was still quite small then so those clients i would call them clients who are already on the hearing journey and there's clients who are looking but haven't seen a, engaged with a professional at any point so they haven't seen someone clinically and they come yeah. out so those clients those were really fun clients to talk to because they hadn't really gone they didn't have an image of how a healthcare professional would be so I was that first point of call and I was telling health that was a smaller portion of my client base a lot of them had already had a touch point with audiologists or hearing healthcare ENTs or GPs etc some of my friends are physios a lot of them are so they would also be able to refer to me which was cool American translation physio is physical therapist is that right oh physiotherapist yeah sorry Aussie slang here we say phys- um, physical therapist, so you say physio, just making a... I, I heard that in another podcast you did, so I wanted to clarify that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. This is Australian English and you're American English, so there's that's a bit right. of a difference, right? Yes, that's right. For anyone good, listening. Good points of clarification. So I, I had a, a unique referral base from a telehealth portion. I don't know if you do as well, but not just hearing healthcare professionals. It's a really grateful for friends of my age, their parents and their parents' groups were experiencing what they perceived as mild to moderate hearing. And mm-hmm. they wanted to come see me. They at at the time I was doing telehealth, it was still a bit of a novel approach. And I still find now to this day people haven't heard of telehealth, which blows my mind. And I love, which tells me if you're in this space, it's still new. You and me, Ben, might be very comfortable with it, but I'm honestly and I'll, and I'll say to some people when I do telehealth consults, how does this compare to other telehealth consults you've had? And they'll say, I've never had one. And I'll say, oh, even just a phone call with, and they go, oh, d-. phone calls are counted as telehealth, but a lot of clients don't see it. They see this as the true telehealth consult. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's still a large portion of the world to educate on the benefits of virtual discussions. It's important for any of us to take a step back and look at our own experiences our own bubble from a bigger macro perspective and realize oh if we're educating the masses then we have to meet them where they are and explain with education what these things that you and i might know so well and so in depth breaking it down to the simplicity whether that's tinnitus or hearing loss online hearing options or in this case how to use zoom video i agree i I guess Similar questions for you. How have you found your experience in the telehealth or digital sense, Ben? Given that I started my company at the beginning of COVID, there was about four months of buildup that I was already working on it, laying the foundation. And that led to suddenly COVID hit. I was locked in a house. I say locked in, but there were lockdowns. I was in a house. I had filming equipment. I had a nice camera. I had a lot of time. I I was in a time when I wasn't working in my normal clinic job due to COVID. So I started in COVID and there was an increased awareness for technology in general and Zoom during COVID. So I hit it at the right time accidentally. And so far, I... And I have been very impressed for any of my patients who are listening with how smooth and how swiftly and quickly they have been working in the telehealth world, whether that's taking the Zoom call from their phone. You know, some people are taking it in the back seat of their car when they're driving because, oh, something happened. They don't want to cancel the appointment. They're still going Love to talk. It. They're still going to do video from their bedroom, from their bed, from their kitchen, from their sofa, from their office, walking, walking around outside. So 
the flexibility it offers is a big unlock. And I'm hoping that this can raise some awareness about that too. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to ask you a little change of subject here. There are many companies now that are selling, in my opinion, after reviewing many of these products, quality hearing aids, hearing technology online called direct to consumer. In the next six to 12 months, there will be more publicity about over the counter hearing aids, which most or all will be sold online. And Kat, in your opinion, what are these big companies doing to the population of people that have hearing or tinnitus? Is this a help? Is this potentially misleading? What are your thoughts on this overall for these big tech companies getting involved? Yeah, I have lots of thoughts on them getting involved. Most of them favorable. I think the intent with all the business stuff aside is is going to be good for our industry, really shining a spotlight on the fact that hearing loss should be addressed. And if big brands are going to come in and do that, I think it's going to be a really positive step for the professionals like yourself and myself in any part of the world. It's going to be challenging from the manufacturer point of view at, at any level, because as I said before, the example is when you think running shoes, you might have a brand that comes to mind straight away. If you think mobile phone, you might have brands that can come to your mind straight away. And I think the hearing aid manufacturers don't have that brand awareness and that is going to be their Achilles heels in, in the long run. I've got ideas of how I think the space will play out and um, I'm a very actions-driven individual, so I like to have a vision, try to create it and learn if it doesn't work so fail quickly. And then, and then move on and, and build upon that if I can or, or change pathways. So I think there's a lot of talk and I see this on, on the social spaces that we're a bit worried, but I think how the professionals are coming around, they're seeing the opportunity that we just have more resources to play with, more tools available for our clients and how you choose to leverage them. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how everybody does in the online space and then in, in the bricks and mortar sense as well. I'm looking forward to the next two to three years. I think that's where there's going to be a bit of scrambling and then it will smoothen out after the three-year um, upheaval and scramble. What do yeah. you think? What do you envision? Well, I envision that there are going to be more and more options and looking at shopping, commerce in general, there's more and more options. There's more and more complexity as technology develops. Now, that technology may make things easier and simplified, but there's more avenues, there's more channels, there's more players, and the internet has such a low barrier of entry that even small companies can make a decent hearing aid and sell it online and market it. You said that you were uh, communicating with some tech companies or some big companies in the hearing space years prior. Do these guys know anything about the patient experience? Where's the bridge there between what you know from the patient experience, how it's more than just a product, and then what they're bringing, which is amazing research and development to actually help the hearing with the technology. Do they know mm. what's going on? What did you learn from those conversations? Yeah, I learned that my role was that I gave them credibility with the content that I was creating or writing for them. They were great at making it. The knowledge translation portion, I think, is really big. Us hearing health professionals, we have a lot of jargon. REMS, you know, HIT, you've got a mild hearing loss. These things mean heaps to us, but to our clients and customers, they, they're they like, I don't know what you mean. Oh, mild, mm -hmm. doesn't sound that bad. I'll just wait. So I had, um, a, pati I had a patient on the podcast earlier. They described their hearing loss as partial hearing loss. And I thought, hey, that's a pretty good term. Maybe we should adopt that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's what I, what you and I know as, as traditional mild, basically 100 year old audiogram is what we know, but the clients don't. It, it was really cool to work with some of these tech companies because, and talk to their audiences, because first of all, their audiences were really engaged, bought into to their brands. And, oh, well, if this healthcare professional is working here or talking here, then it's got to be legit. So I learned that they knew what they were doing from the marketing perspective pretty quickly. And that's okay because I said this to you before, before we started recording, I think it is very important that if we have consumer electronic companies flooding the market, that the content they're putting out there, if you're in the healthcare field and you're trying to market, that the person who's writing your content has a healthcare professional background at least. And they understand how to read peer-reviewed articles and translate that 
the knowledge from the peer-reviewed articles to everyday language that everybody can understand to a certain extent. If I can't explain an article to my husband who's not in the hearing healthcare industry, then I'm not explaining it good enough. I have confidence that you do. Yeah, he's like almost like a pseudo-audiologist. I'm always talking ears and hearing. <laughs> so that's probably not a good example, but say to your 16 or 20 year old cousin or niece or nephew that, you know, has, a, they understand where their ears are on their body and what hearing is and listening is, then you need to really scale back the language you're using. That's what I'm learning. If you have an aunt or an uncle right now who's 65 years old, tells you they're having some trouble hearing, they want to know their options, where would you advise them to start? Um, I, I tell them to do the you hear <laughs> online hearing test. You know, I'm a big advocate of proactive proactivity in healthcare full stop. That's what my posts are always about. Let's have healthy aging forever. Let's be active in the systems we've built. So first of all, I'll say to my mother-in-law or my father-in-law, they're great examples. Please, 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 please get your hearing tested. Oh, no. And, and they know, I know something's going on, but I don't want to do it, Cat, I'll just wait till things, technology is better and then you can fit me with something that will just fix my hearing loss. And I say, no. That's not, no matter how good and advanced the technology gets, it'll never, you'll never hear like you did when you're in your 20s. So I get them educated on what they could be doing mm -hmm. and I don't flood them with information and then I let them free and go off to figure out what they want to do and they'll always come back with, to me with questions and answers. But at a base, I say from 40 to 45 years and if you work in a heavy noise induced role or industry that you should be getting a hearing checked every year i know people think that's an overkill but the more i think about it we get our eyes here checked every year every two years and you, some people get i ask this in all my healthcare consults how often do you get your eyes and your teeth checked and some people get their teeth checked twice a year and mm -hmm. once a year minimal minimally and I say, well, you should be thinking ears in that equation. I'm not saying you need to get your ears checked twice a year. I'm saying minimum once a year, just get that re-screen. It doesn't have to be full diagnosis unless um, the audiologist has recommended that. But now you can get apps where you can screen your hearing conveniently, third-party apps as well, and, and log those profiles. Because if something suddenly happens mm -hmm. and you've got a longitudinal set of data, I can go, oh, look at this. And you said that this event has happened. This is great. And that's so where, true. in general sense, that's where healthcare will shift. We'll have personalized data that we're logging in a really seamless manner with our technology. And then when we have issues, we'll say, hey, I want to share it with my GP or my cardiologist or my psychologist or my dietitian. And because we've logged it for months or years on end, some of us years, we'll have really rich data to work with to extrapolate rather than here wear this heart rate monitor for the next 24 to 48 hours and then I'll figure out and then I'll have a bit of a snapshot of what's happening so data's gone from this to, to this it's so true when I see a patient and they report I developed sudden tinnitus I got a hearing test it was my first hearing test I have hearing loss I ask them do you think your hearing changed they say what do you mean is it harder for you to hear people yes or no no I don't think so then I usually diagnose that as sudden tinnitus, neurological, not changes to the cochlea. But if we had a previous audiogram, a baseline test like you just so nicely suggested, then it would have a lot, a lot more stronger validation with a diagnosis. So totally agree. As we're wrapping up here, I wanna pass it to you. You're very active on, on all the social platforms. So thank you because I've listened to you numerous episodes on different podcasts and I, I'm a fan of yours. I want to give you the opportunity, whether it's your own personal, in general, or with your job with Nuhira, would you like to share any projects that you're working on or anything that you want listeners to be aware of in the next six to 12 months? Thanks for that. I'm a fan of yours as well, Ben. I really like your energy. Um, it's fantastic. And I love what you're doing in the Tinder space um, and hopefully more in future. So the biggest takeaways I always like to put out um, on talks now is, and this is very applicable to our clients, our patients, and us as healthcare professionals, is I want us to be thinking about not just what's happening right then and there for people who are in front of us, but what is the bigger picture for us as healthcare professionals so we can think about prevention when it comes to hearing loss, 
hearing difficulties and ear related disorders or diseases promotion so how do we promote ourselves and how do we promote the knowledge that we know to our clients and customers and proactivity and, that, and those three p's i've decided are, are what i want the world to know about when it comes to hearing health but in healthcare in general so if you can prevent something with your hearing to prevent hearing loss that's my take home. My promotion there is get your baseline hearing checks done, get your baseline audiograms done and then screen with your third-party apps or with apps that are built into products like Ear ID. They have to be quality screening tools as well, not just a no brand, no name from the app store. And number three, be proactive with your healthcare. So if your client, if you're telling your clients, Ben, do one, two and three, I want you to be following up that they're doing one, two, and three because that seven to 10 year gap is totally unacceptable in our industry. And if people had more confidence in us, understood prevention, understood promotion of the knowledge that we know the importance of untreated hearing loss or hearing diseases and ear diseases and disorders, then they would be more proactive with what they're doing. Getting hearing help when you're 72 is an unacceptable age to be doing something about your hearing, hearing issues. For, both, for all parties involved, us as healthcare professionals in the industry, we've done a disservice to everybody in that regard. Those there's are my take-home points. There's an opportunity to improve. There's an opportunity to have positive change. So thank you, Kat. Kat Penno from Australia. You've been a wonderful guest. It's been a pleasure to meet you. This has been episode 23. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.